Onward with our studies, we know the movement of particles is given by gauge fields and the geometry of space-time. And we've talked briefly about the former in the last video, so we talk about the latter today. The geometry of Minkowski space-time, which is created by considering the relativity of causality for observers, is represented by a mathematical structure known as the Poincaré algebra. We will try out the following line of reasoning. Are we to be presented with a particle, we'll see how the kinematic properties of this particle change according to the geometry of movement in space-time. Doing so, we'll see that the particles have two intrinsic quantities, one related to linear movement, which is the form momentum, and the other related to rotational movement, which is the angular momentum. If you look at a quantum mechanical particle in its corresponding state, and look only at how the rotations change the state, we'll see the representations of the set of rotations, which is the Lorentz group, forces the state to either be a fermion or a boson. We call this effect of angular momentum representations the spin of the particle. Objects in space-time can only have so many different movements. You can either move in the three axes of space, x, y, and z, which we might represent as vector translations, or you can locally shift stuff in a frame by means of spatial rotations around the three axes, which we represent as bivectors. And we can also perform Lorentz boosts. A Lorentz boost is just a hyperbolic rotation around the time axis as well, and so is given by a set of three hyperbolic bivectors. That means we have four translations, three spatial rotations, and three Lorentzian pseudo-rotations, which are the Lorentz boosts. All of these respect the Minkowski metric by keeping space-time intervals constant, and physically that means you won't rotate around an axis and see someone with a different energy and such. Using some index notation, you can actually write down what all this means mathematically. You'll say, well, I have a position vector, x mu, and I'll do two things to it. I'll do a translation, which means adding another vector to it to get that another position vector with a different magnitude, and then I'll perform a boost or a rotation, which keeps my magnitude constant over here, and I can do this by this lambda element. The lambda element forms a group, meaning it behaves like a geometric number under multiplication, closure and all, and the name of this group is the Lorentz group. With matrices, you can define this group to be this statement that is the set of all general linear 4x4 matrices with real entries that keep the metric eta constant under a composition lambda, eta la lambda transpose. Ideally, then, you want to write down a set of elements that do all of these movements and keep space-time constant. This then forms the Poincaré group, which has all these tiny puzzle pieces to it. The elements of this group are generators of movement, meaning they're infinitesimal versions of regular movement and behave as these geometric numbers. The generators of translations are the respective momenta in each direction. Note that the time translator is the time momentum, which is just the energy, of course, and the generators of rotation are the respective pieces of angular momenta. The boost generators are angular momenta also, but in the frame where time is also an axis. Notice that if you want a finite piece of movement, you need to take these generators and exponentiate them in order to get, say, 30 degrees around the x-axis by exponentiating rx to the desired amount. The rules of each puzzle piece are put in the Lie brackets, which tell you what ought to happen whenever you do something. This makes up a Lie algebra. For example, the JP bracket, the one telling you how a rotation and translation ought to behave, gives you another translation. And this is pretty easy to see if you carry out some mathematics, easier still if you just draw a picture. The JP bracket means that you have a composition, JP minus PJ. That means you apply a rotation to something, then a translation. Then, in the second case, you do the opposite. You apply translation and then a rotation. Now, if you track a point in the object, you notice this gives you a different result, which is pretty intuitive. The exact difference between these two results will be the desired vector, or better, the total transformation result. There are two special elements that behave nicely. These elements are known as Casimir invariants, and which were discovered by Meyer and Einstein in 1932. They are nice because they commute with all the other elements, meaning their brackets always carry out to be zero. They tell you things that don't change in value regardless of what transformation you apply to them, that is, relativistically covariant things. So the first invariant is momentergy, which is the form momentum magnitude, which doesn't change regardless of how you change your frame of reference, and that we knew already. And the second thing is the poly lubonsky pseudovector. The momentergy is related to linear motion, and the poly lubonsky pseudovector is related to rotational motion. You can see it is a dual of a bivector, so it is related to a quantity conserved due to angular momentum, and indeed, it is a measure of a particle's intrinsic angular momentum as it sweeps through space-time. 
This is often called spin. Now, notice this is all classical physics, and this is classical spin. Classical spin, which is not often mentioned in undergraduate courses, is in a tiny bivector that sits in the hypersurface of simultaneity of a particle as it moves along its trajectory. Were you to calculate the difference this classical spin makes in regular electromagnetism, it is essentially the same as it does in the Pauli equation in quantum theory, which is a tiny correction, so not very much, but it is there. Therefore, we have seen that there are two fundamental quantities in space-time created by its geometry, momentum and spin one related to linear motion and the other to rotational motion. The first quantity determines the overall kinematical behavior of the particle, while the second one does little to distinguish itself, in the classical theory of course. Were you to see where it really distinguishes itself, you'd see it in general relativity or in quantum mechanics. General relativity states that if you look at the momentum content of a region, that relates to the torque curvature of that region, which is known as the einstein cartan moment of rotation G. But what Einstein also said with Cartan in einstein cartan theory is that if the first invariant momentum makes such a difference, the second invariant, spin, should also shape spacetime in some way. This breeds the notion of absolute parallelism which manifests itself as stating that if mass and energy curve space-time, then spin torsion space-time. This torsion behavior is, however, very small. The quantum mechanical part is what related to spin statistics and is what interests us. Again, we are interested in seeing how quantum states change according to all those rotation generators. Suppose you only look at the boosts and rotations. You'll be able to decompose the sets of transformations of this group in two major types. Whether it conserves the parity of an object, so whether it flips space like a mirror, or whether it conserves the temporal flux of an object, so whether it flips time like a mirror. Doing so, you end up with the puzzle pieces of the Lorentz group. The idea is simple. By looking at representations of this group, we will observe that the nature of whether a particle was a boson, which is a particle that represents a gauge field, or a fermion, which is a particle that represents matter, is determined by how the particle is transformed according to these subgroups. The parity can be measured by taking a volume element, in this case a quadrivector, and looking at the orientation it has after the transformation. By convention, your coordinates are always set up in such a way the volume has a positive orientation. So you have your E0 at G1, etc. quadrivector, and if it so happens the world flips like a mirror, then the order of the elements is reversed and you have an element with negative volume. Therefore, transformations that flip parity are known as improper, and the ones that conserve it are known as proper. And so all the matrices that obey these determinant rules are called proper or improper, because the determinant is just the volume magnitude, and its sign is the orientation. The temporal flow bit is seen not by looking at the volume, but just by looking at an observer's time vector. If the vector is positive, we'd say it's an orthochronous transformation since it retains the flow of time in the usual order, and if it's negative, then evidently time is flowing backwards, which we call antichronous. We then have four groups with each combination of elements. The up arrow denotes orthochronous, the down arrow antichronous, the plus is proper, and the minus is improper. The regular subgroup of proper orthochronous transformations is known as the regular Lorentz group, and is a normal tetrad. That is, there have been no unusual modifications to the observer's view. We will later see how this relates to spinner structure. Now, suppose we had a particle's vector quantity like its momenta in an initial state p. We shall then apply a orthochronous improper transformation to this state. In coordinates, we are flipping elements t, x, y, z to t, minus x, minus y, minus z. We will call, whenever we apply the subgroup as a transformation, the parity operator. We then write down p, p, ket as the application of such a group. The result in the chosen vector quantity is the momental reversal of direction. It is algebraically a unitary operator. That's because, geometrically, by flipping twice the world like a mirror, we end up exactly where we started. It is observing the antichronous transformations that things get interesting. By applying a proper antichronous transformation, we flip time like a mirror and retain the spatial directions. We will call this t the time reversal operator. Our basic results are that time reversal twice is equivalent to rotating something by 360 degrees, and applying a parity and time reversal operation is equivalent to the new charge conjugation operation. Let our momentum state p be time reversed. This now yields minus p because the particle is traveling in the opposite direction with the reverse velocity. Now, let our momenta be again time reversed. This is not p again, but rather it is p times the phase factor. 
we know that our quantum state has a probability amplitude associated to it, which is a complex number. We also know the phase of this amplitude is irrelevant since we're only interested in the magnitude. This means there is a whole circle of amplitudes that could fit our momentum state now, which is displayed by this phase term. So now we have a question. We know reversing it once gives us the opposite state, but reversing it twice gives us what? There is a freedom of choice here. We can either make this phase term 1, meaning that we flip time like a mirror again and things behave as they did before, or we can have that the phase term squares to minus 1 because it's i, and now we still have our time reverse momentum state. Indeed, the time reversal operator is anti-unitary. Applying it twice gives us either 1 or minus 1. It's a mapping from i to minus i. To accommodate this, we can write a generic superposition of states a and b and see how their amplitudes conjugate under time reversal and became a product of conjugate and normal amplitudes in twice time reversal. Suppose now we apply an improper anti-Kronos transformation, which is the last group we need to see. This is equal to applying a PT transformation, and it flips all components. Algebraically, are we due to do this again, we end up with a PTPT operation, which is equal to a PPTT operation, and that's P squared, which is 1, and now we have our TT, which is plus or minus 1. But notice PT is exactly to just having minus TXYZ directly, which is a flip in the TX plane and a flip in the YZ plane, which is a 180 degree rotation. Therefore, twice applying PT is equivalent to minus minus T minus X minus Y minus Z, which is another 180 degree flip in the two planes. Therefore, a PT PT transformation is just a two pi flip. And we see that this is equal to a double time reversal. Therefore, flipping time twice is equivalent to a 360 degree rotation. This physically means that doing a 2 pi rotation can possibly change a quantum state or keep it constant. As some of you might know, this is precisely the distinction between fermions and bosons. Bosons are particles where t squared is equal to 1, so a 2 pi rotation makes no change, whilst fermions are particles where t squared is equal to minus 1, so a 2 pi rotation inverts the state. It seems that nature is offered two choices when making particles and chooses both. This is presented by the spinner geometry, as we'll see shortly. A formal step we must do is convert a real SO31 group into a complexified SL2C group. This is done in order to find the extra projective geometrical aspects of the space, much in the same way we complexified SO32 SU2 to find spinner representations. Let J be rotations and K boosts. The J generators evidently close into a Lie algebra, but the Ks do not. We see that the KK bracket yields a J element. This is called a Wigner rotation, and it happens because of successive projections onto the plane of simultaneity. To fix this, we complexified both into elements A and B. Formally analyzing isomorphisms, we get the SL2C algebra, which is then exponentiated into the full SL2C group. Doing some more math, you end up that you can classify representations of this group by means of its lowest weights. The weights come in terms of half units. For every half unit you add of this, which we'll anticipate interpretation as half units of spin, there is a different type of equation that represents particle motion and a different type of field. Therefore, from the symmetries of space-time, we get the different types of particles in the standard model. For spin zero, we have scalar fields that obey the Klein-Gordon operator, which is intuitively the de Lambert wave operator proportional to some mass. So the field wiggles with more difficulty the heavier it is, but carries only its magnitude. For spin and half of either right or left chirality, we have spinner fields that obey the Dirac operator in the full case, or the Lyle or Majorana and Majorana equations in either spin one half zero case. For spin one, we have vector fields that obey the Laplace Beltrami operator, which is a generalized heat per se, in the form of the Maxwell or Proca equations. For spin three half, we have a Harita Schwinger operator, which is a generalization of the Dirac operator for higher spin fields. And for spin 2, we have tensor fields that should give a gravity operators of sorts, but I haven't figured that one out. The internal freedom of such particles is given by both their momentergy content and their spin. If we look at the momentergy classification, we get four different cases. The first case is a massive particle traveling inside the light cone, which obviously means its momentergy sits in the mass shell. Here, 
the particle has full rotational freedom since that doesn't affect the momentum energy. The second one is for massless particles that are run along the light cone. Their symmetry degenerates, and we'll mention this later. The third and fourth cases are not very interesting. The third case is for our hypothetical tachyonic particles that run outside a light cone, so faster than light. And the fourth is just the quantum mechanical vacuum state. In the massless case, particles only travel along the light cone, so the angular momentum can only possibly change along rotations, reflections, and translations in the spatial hypersurface orthogonal to their three momentum vector. This is given by the group of Euclidean two-dimensional plane transformation known as E2 or ISO2. Here I've drawn the circumstance. The particle on the light cone is being reflected in the XT plane. Because of this, we define a new quantity, the helicity. We only measure the spin of the particle along its momentum energy by projecting it onto the spin vector and then scaling it down by the momentum energy content. Contrast this to the massive case, where SO3 was still a freedom. A particle can rotate along all three spatial axes and make no difference, but here you're constrained. Moving to an axis orthogonal to the wave vector evidently changes the projection of the momentum energy onto the spin. Although shackled by these points, the quantum mechanical state of the particle itself still has large amounts of freedom. The particle, when transformed by some element of the Lorentz group, acquires a small phase factor to its probability amplitude. The phase picked up is proportional to the helicity times the angle variation in some plane. This means that the quantum state can be written as a sum of negative and positive helicity states, and this internal set of sums is called the polarization of a particle. The photon, for example, has two major polarization states, and you can write the others as combinations of them on the Bloch sphere. This is actually made clear in this article. This all relates to statistics very simply. Suppose we had two identical particles, A and B, bouncing off each other at an angle theta. Let's call the amplitude associated to this process F theta, where theta is the angle of the bounce. The particles will undergo a bounce from the state 1 to state A, and from B to 2. Now, if the particles were to scatter in the opposite sense, that is, from A to 2 and from B to 1, then we'll call this amplitude F pi minus theta. Since the particles are indistinguishable from each other, we can't really distinguish the two ways they can bounce off each other, but since we have those two choices nevertheless, this means we acquire a phase factor to our amplitude in the choice that we make. And in the same way as double time reversal, we have that the square will be the same, but the sign can be flipped depending on the phase angle. In the same way as before, if the phase here squares to 1, we'll have the total amplitude of the scattering process be the sum of the original process f theta and the new process f pi minus theta. In other words, the probabilities for the two events contribute to each other, making this more likely. However, where the phase squared to minus 1, the probabilities would cancel out each other, diminishing the total chance of it happening. Indeed, this is the fundamental statistical distinction between fermions and bosons. If you let the states 1 and 2 approach each other, you see the result of the fermion amplitude is 0, meaning fermions cannot be in the same state. This is the Pauli exclusion principle, and generates things like Fermi-Dirac statistics for matter. So, in summary, if you look at the symmetries of space-time and how they act on a quantum state, you realize you got two things. First, you get the spin representations of space-time, which tell you all the particle types you can have. And second, if you divide the two types into half-integer and integer spins, you conclude that the difference between them is that integer spins conserve the phase of an amplitude, while half-integer spins reverse it, making up different statistics. If you further investigate all of these topics, you find all kinds of clearer connections and behaviors. A very important one was pointed out by Ohanian that one can indeed visualize spin in terms of certain densities in quantum field theory. Another one is how this relates to norm division algebras and knots. You will later see that spin is a very specific geometric property for general types of spaces which breeds spin geometry. Thanks for watching.